So I, I've asked some guys to read some Bible verses, and so if you'll come up, and, and I think it's uh, Patrick is first, and on the way I'm going to tell you a daddy story, because this is Father's Day, and it happened yesterday, so uh, funny story. I'm praying on my deck. I had a very busy morning. I'm in the afternoon now, and I'm praying on my deck. And uh, I've got the umbrella out, you know, to shield myself from the heat, the sun, right? You know what I'm talking about here in Wyoming. And all of a sudden, this massive gust of wind comes in from the west. Go figure. Blows my umbrella, just gets underneath, and I'm like, oh, no. <clears throat> my umbrella's going to go. And I'm going to save my umbrella, right? So I grab it, I clench down, and another blast of wind hits it and picks me up, literally out of my chair, blows me back, and I'm thinking, I'm going to Nebraska. <laughs> and I'm in midair, literally. I let go, and I slam down on my glutamus maximus. And the minute I hit the ground, I'm like breaking out laughing because I thought, you know, that would have been a great video. So, now listen, don't get cheeky with me. Ah, uh, dad joke. Never mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> anyway, that was my Father's Day present, was a, the wind of God blew and took me away. Okay, so all the guys, if you would come up, we're going to read a few verses, and we're going to jump into a big deal today. So... Yeah, kids have been released, so. Yep, go for it, Patrick. This is Malachi 4, 5, 6. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Okay. This is John 7, 37 through 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures, scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So 2 Corinthians uh, 6, 11. Our mouth is spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is opened wide. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. Now, in a like exchange, I speak also as to children, open wide to us also. Matthew 10, 5 through 8. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter, enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim the message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who, who have leprosy, drive out demons, Freely you have received, freely give. Second Corinthians 7, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one, we have corrupted no one, we have exploited no one. Beautiful. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. We appreciate you so much. All right. So back in 1988 uh, in Wisconsin, some of you know the story, uh, Janet, I received a visitation from the Lord around Malachi 4, 5, and 6. And it had to do with God changing the wineskin of the church to family. And he told me he was going to turn the hearts emphasis on hearts, to the children, and the children back to the fathers. And it was a radical understanding that God was changing uh, the institutional uh, uh, 
basically classic church model to family. So it was a big deal to me, and it shook me up pretty bad, and because uh, it had so many deep implications. Out of that kind of revelation, uh, God led me into really doing research on the role of fathering and the problem society, and it ended up in this dissertation, a uh, doctoral dissertation on restoring the spiritual family as the emerging apostolic paradigm. And it has to do with fathering. And uh, basically, we can point sociologically, psychologically, biblically even, to the impact of fatherlessness on our culture. And prisons are filled with people that are fatherless. Uh, we have horrific shootings in schools, and largely it's because of the breakdown of fa fathers and families. Uh, you know, most of our cultural maladies come out of fatherlessness, and this violation or this disconnect between uh, men and, f and, and couples and then family. So it's, it's epidemic. And the Bible says in Malachi, in the last days, God's going to do something radical with male people. And it doesn't mean women aren't involved. Of course they are. But he's going to isolate on men in a special way for, because maybe they're, they've, they've slipped into more narcissism and immaturity than, than women. We don't know that, but it seems that has been the case. And narcissism and immaturity has caused men to sire babies and yet not nurture them in the things of the Lord from their heart. And so the Lord is going to do a big work. And the role model for me, one of them in the scriptures, the Apostle Paul, and he was just so attuned to his own spirit man, his own heart, that he knew when it was opened or not. He knew it was when it was connected or not. And he knew whether life was coming from heaven through him to others. Because the word father literally means source. It means becoming a conduit of the life of God. And so God is looking for a people, men and women, who will, be, who will be partnering with Jesus to give life. Now, we have this upcoming tribal coming, and a lot of people are showing up, and I, I, as amazing as our lineup of trainers is, and it's going to be largely experiential versus uh, content, as amazing as the lineup of people, the main reason people show up here is for, for relationships. One guy told me, he says, uh, his wife told me, he says, why, why do you want to go to tribal? He says, because I want to be around a large group of happy people that love me. I'm like, all right, that works. They're going to travel literally a chunk of the country to get here just to be around people that are happy and will love them. It's like, geez. Because why? Because out of every person who's got Jesus, there is some measure of life that emits out of you, whether you know it or not. And you may not be able to detect it. You may be in a bad mood. You may have just blown it. You may have just sinned even. But you cannot stop the liquid life that's flowing out of you uh, in Christ. Now, you can quench the spirit. You can grieve the spirit. But you can't stop the spirit. And so what we're, what we're after is to individually work on growing in our ability to conduct life to people. And uh, again, I said father means source, but mother <laughs> comes from the word paraclete, which means one who comes alongside of, and it's the word for Holy Spirit. The woman emits this nurturing, life-giving, fruit-bearing life. And so both people, both genders, and there really are genders, right? <laughs> that wasn't a joke, but it was kind of. There really are genders. I can define a woman very clearly. Uh, and I don't have to be on the Supreme Court. So you, there are real, there's real distinctions and real similarities that both male and female people have an ability to be conduits of life. And that's what we're going for. And so there's, a, there's an inventory I want to take. There's a deliberateness and intentionality I want to have about being a spiritual dad, about being a, a, just a believer, and I want to admit life. I want to be a person that walks around hosing people down. I just want to do that. It's fun for me. It's fun. Um, we had a guy, his name is Pat. He, uh, he pumps out septic tanks. And he just got out of uh, high school here in Laramie. He's a big kid. Looked Hispanic to me. He pulls up. 
and uh, and I'm I'm out. I walk out to greet him. I say, "Hey, what's happening? You know how you doing?" I I said, and so rather than just you know let's get on with this, I you know I wanted to find out about him. So I found out about his life. I found out he had a girlfriend down in Colorado. I found out his plans for his life, and just listened to his story and had something. I told him, I said, "Man, you're a big dude. Have you?" You know, you're a thick guy, you know, have you played football? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I have. Well, I have too, so hey, let's talk about that. And then we just got into this conversation. And then, now this is going to be a little crazy, but Jeff opened the door. <laughs> then I said, I said, okay, Pat, let's pump this ST out of this ground. And he looks at me like, <laughs> no. I said, has anybody ever asked you to do that, pump the stuff out of the ground? And he goes, no, that was awesome. <laughs> Later he finds out that I'm one of our, you know, leaders here at the church and that I, you know, I'm all about Jesus. And I think he connected as like, gone. this guy's crazy real. He's fun. He loves me. And he's in the church? I mean, it didn't even like tilt. It was so fun to give him a big hug. I took a selfie. I sent it to him. And I just had this moment with Pat. The poop pumper. I mean, come on. It's every time, all the time, do we get to love on people. And uh, that's the aspiration of a believer. And so um, there's some things we want to know about this. It's the, the, how this all works. And you can, you can actually parse it out from Scripture. You can figure it out from Scripture if you're really interested in becoming a life-giving person, partnering with Jesus. It's really fun. First thing we need to know is that we are born initially with a, a smaller heart, a, and it's always elastic, it's always capable of growing, but like every river, um, the or, original uh, kind of point of release of a river is very small. You can go up here to the North Platte and walk over it. You can, you can actually walk over the Missouri River at one point, even the Colorado Right outside Estes, you can go down there and step over it. Even the Mississippi that's a couple miles wide in places, there's an original point where it's just that big. It's just so, uh, so big you can step over it. So it originates small and little. It's kind of shallow, and the, and the banks are not wide. So here's the deal. The river that, that we read about here is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the life of God that is eternal. And it's abundant. So that river is God himself. It's a force. It's a life. It's uncreated life. That doesn't mean it, and it's eternal. That doesn't just mean it goes on forever. That means it is, um, it doesn't wear down according to the laws of thermodynamics. It doesn't wear down. It, it wraps up. It amps up. And so now we're the river banks, right? We're the initial river banks, and our banks can be so wide and so deep. And the goal is to ask the Lord to increase our capacity every day, getting a larger bank and a, you know, a deeper bed and a larger bank. We're the river banks of heaven. And corporately, we'll conduct some measure of river this coming, you know, in a week and a half. You will individually, and we will corporately. And the goal here is to get so big and so deep in the river banks of our heart that we conduct lots and lots of life to the point it's called rivers, plural, rivers, plural. And so I'm always trying to figure out what lends itself to life, what throttles down life, what opens up life, how do I, how do I work with my own heart here. Now, Paul the Apostle, he, he goes into the church of Cor Corinth. And we read this, and, and the passage is absolutely staggering to me. He comes in as a spiritual father. He doesn't, need, he doesn't need a title. He doesn't need an official license. He doesn't need ordination. He just is under the commissioning of heaven. So he postures up the way God told him who he was. He's a spiritual father. He's a son first and a father second. And he comes in, and the number one thing he's all about is hosing people down in the Holy Spirit. And so he says, I open wide my heart to you, Corinthians. And that's the game. He was self-aware. My heart is elastic, it's open, and my riverbanks are deep and wide. 
and God is gushing out of me in the form of affection. He called it in Philippians, the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, I know we've talked about this before, but I don't know as if you can overteach this stuff. And so it's, it's a mystical affection. It isn't even a soul affection. You know, a human being that doesn't know Jesus can have affection. Even a dog can have affection. Sometimes people get more steady affection out of their dog than they do people. Right? Man's best friend, right? But listen, there's a spiritual affection. There's the affection of Jesus. It's a higher plane. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's shalom peace. It's not just human peace. It's the peace that passes understanding. There's a joy. It's not just a human joy. It's the joy of the Lord. There is an affection. It's the affection of Jesus. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a miraculous level of God life that can flow his emotion through our human emotions, our human spirit. It's an amazing thing. And so, I, I, you know, when I meet people, I, you know, my goal, <laughs> if I'm in my game and I'm still, and I'm, you know, I'm on, and I'm on task, I'm, my goal is to get my heart open and, secondly, to get my heart connected. So I want to open and connect it. Now, you know, you can build a connection with somebody in, honestly, minutes, like I did with Patrick, the pooper scooper. I mean, I did, I got a connection with him, and he feel, felt love. He felt like he had a friend and somebody that he could connect with, and he's got my number and all that business. Now, the goal really now for me is to go further with our people and go, not only do we want a connection, we want an attached, uh, hesed-based connection that is secure and long-term. I want a long-term covenant with people because that's what God has with me into eternity. So that my, my back, uh, you know, my platform for loving people long-term is God loves me long-term even in my weakness, even when I sin, even when I'm a nincompoop. He's there. He's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. He's, ne- he's always attached to me. There's no gap or distance between me and God. Never. I'm always, you know, bad mood, good mood. Weird, not weird. Doesn't matter. Doesn't alter the living God. He stays with me, in, in, even in my weakness. The knowledge of that, that he's never going to leave me and forsake me, gives me the backup plan, the support base to pick up my cross and try to establish covenant with people when they're in their weakness, when they blow it. And so what we're going after is a kind of people and this is very important for you to capture the vision of this. We're looking for people that will mature in their river banks and their river base, their river bed and their river banks, to where they can consistently conduct the life of God to people even in their weakness and stay connected to them when they blow it. That, that, so I'm going to call that a, an anchor glue person, a foundational glue person. Now we know that maturity has stages. You start out being an infant. You have tons of needs. You have to freely receive as an infant. And there's lots of gaps that none of us got filled, and we have to go back and refill those gaps. Then we mature into childhood, and our riverbank goes deeper. I mean, goes wider and deeper. Then we mature into adult maturity levels. We get more needs met. Then we get uh, more ability to conduct life. Then our riverbank gets bigger, and we come into the parent stage of maturity. And then finally, the capstone of maturity in the kingdom is called eldering. And eldering people, they become a stabilizing force for the culture of a whole tribe, a whole people group. They emit, the, the consistently emit the life of Jesus into the atmosphere. And they help establish the ecosystem of affection and joy. That's an elder. And an elder, we need to all aspire to be elders. And an elder is not falsely humble. An elder recognizes that if they don't show up, there's a vacuum in the atmosphere. There's a, there's a, there's a hole in the space that they're called to be that conduit of life. People draw life from them. It's not, it's not that them that they're after. They're not narcissistic at all. It's all to release the life of Jesus to other people. An elder lives for the community of faith, the family of God not for themselves. They're self-denying, self-sacrificing, 
and they show up and open up and connect up in order to bring life. That's an elder in the kingdom. And I had a guy who's very well respected in the community. He's been a worship leader. He got hurt in the church. He's checked out. And uh, I'm talking to him the other day in his shop. And he goes, you know, we, I began to talk about church leadership. And he goes, I, I'm literally so hurt by the church. I don't think I can handle the institutional atmosphere anymore. And I said, that's because of such a large percentage of immature, narcissistic people. And he goes, that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. Now, this is a relational issue, right? This is a maturity issue. He has been so wounded by the immaturity of people in the church, particularly leaders, that he's like, I can't handle that kind of pain. I can't handle that kind of pain. And I'm like, you know, I get it. I so get it. That I'm on, I told him, I'm on, I'm trying to get on the fast track myself and all of our leaders of being the kind of people that reveal what Jesus is really like. And he goes, wow, I'd love to see that in my lifetime. <laughs> it's like, okay, all right, there we go. 63 million people have left the church because of this issue. And they're waiting, they're waiting for authentic and real. And I don't know, I, the, door, the, the journey to that place is not easy. There's so many knot holes to go through. So much has to get deconstructed and then reconstructed and then deconstructed and then reconstructed for us to have that kind of resilience in the face of attachment pain. It's rough. But I'll tell you what, we're going to go there because we are a family that's going to love the hell out of people. Thank you, Jeff, for opening the door. We are, and, and I said that to Tim the other day, and he goes, wow, that seems a little cussy. And I'm like, well, think about it, man. Think about it. Hell is all up inside of people. Rejection and wounding and, and orphanness and insecurities and reject. I mean, all of it's there just bubbling and seething. And, so and who is going to help be a conduit that displaces all that pain and helps heal people from their trauma in yesterday's world and life? Who's going to do that? What's, where's the skin of heaven that's going to help facilitate that? Well, we're volunteering, and it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but I can't, I can't stand to hear one more person, and I know I'm going to hear it hundreds of times, but one more person say, I can't take the church because it's not safe. And I'm talking about people that know Jesus, they know Holy Spirit, and they believe the Bible, but they're immature, they're broken, and they have pockets of narcissism that haven't been dealt with. And I'm like, oh, gosh. I went home and I said, man, I bought a little part for, for him from him. And then I went home and I said, God, not anymore on my watch. I am so burdened by this. Burdened by this. And I just opened up my own weakness to the Lord, my own vulnerability to him, my own, you know, mistakes and my own humanity. And I said, just... Do one more time with this lump of clay what you want to do. But I just want to reveal what you're like to people. That's all I want to do. That's all I want to do. And I want to, get a, I want to join with a whole bunch of other radical crazos people that will do the same thing. And so I felt like God's just smiling. So we're bringing in a bunch of people that they have competencies to help us get there. Whether it's a manual healing or a manual lifestyle or it's all going to be about experiencing this way with Jesus, for sure. We are going to be a people that never back away from the supernatural, never back away from the person of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do this without the Holy Spirit. At the same time, we got to learn how to love well, how to listen well, how to attune, how to validate, and all these other relational skills that are so critical. And people are willing to pace Pay a little money and pay up for a lot of gas, a lot of gas money. Like, have you hit the pump lately? It's bad. 
They're going to pay for gas to reposition their bodies to get here, to be in a, in, a, in a hothouse environment for presencing and for connecting. Here. I mean, I'm telling you, it's, tell you what, if one person showed up with that desperation, it's worth me to be here and you to be here to do that. And because I feel very elderly-like, although I'm not, I'm, I'm moving toward being an elder-level maturity. I don't know where I'm at in that, but I'm trying to get there. And here's the thing. False humility says my presence doesn't matter. It's, I, my, I'm optional. I'm not that big a whoop. And the answer is, okay, hold on. That's not, exa- that's not humility at all. Humility is saying I'm going to agree with God, what God says about me. And then I'm going to position myself in a place that conducts life even if it's inconvenience to me. I'm going to be one of those glue people. I'm going to be a sticky love person. And I'm going to show up and I'm going to be consistently there year in and year out in order to to reveal what little river and what little Jesus I can or big, whatever. Now, I I want you to know something. It was the daddy heart of God the mommy heart of God, that started our tribals in the first place. We were in the inner city, and I was working with urban inner city kids, black kids, Hispanic kids, loving them up, you know, in our property in a convent, on the grounds of the convent in the inner city. And every time I asked them, you know, well, first of all, they called Janet my girlfriend because they didn't even have a point of reference for a wife. Janet was my girlfriend. Is that your girlfriend? I mean, literally, no reference to stable marriage at all, covenant at all. All right, so no, here's, we're married, and here's what marriage is, and it's like clueless. That's when I came up with the ooze and the slime and chased kids around and, you know, pulled green slime out of my chest and ran them down, tackled them, and said, I'm sliming you with the love of Jesus. And I did all that stuff. Then I recognized that they had never left the neighborhood. Some of these kids are 10, 12 years old. They've never left the inner city. They had no point, no resource to do it. And I'm like, okay, spiritual fathering, tribal family, I'm, we're contending against the Crips and the Bloods. They're marking our buildings. They're doing drive-bys. And I'm like, okay, we got to get a group identity here. If they're Crips and Bloods, we're the rock tribe, you know, and then we had the dog tags, and then we had the hats, and then we, anything to start sending the message you belong. You belong to a family that loves you. No, those kids have ever had a picture taken, or very rarely a picture taken of them, because nobody was healthy enough to take their picture or had the ability to. So we're snapping pictures all the time, snapping pictures. And then I felt the Lord say, take them on vacation. And he says, I want them to see mountains. And I'm like... How are we? We don't have any money. We're tired. We don't have any resources and hardly no leaders at all that would go on this journey with us. God goes, do it anyway. I'll cover it. I'll cover it. I'm a good dad. I'll cover this vacation. So I hunted all around the place. How can we cut corners? How can we? And the Lord said, don't cut corners. Call the YMCA camp in Estes Park and reserve rooms you got to pay for them in advance. Reserve rooms for this YMCA camp in Estes Park. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's an amazing place. I mean, amazing. if we could do tribals there sometime, <laughs> just the work involved, though. It's just so, but we had to raise money to pay for the meal tickets, the rooms. We had to organize transportation, everything. We did that, I think, in 2002, and we invited different people to come. One of the guys was the founder of Antioch Ministries. It was one of the best church planning movements in America, Jimmy Seibert. We've had Floyd McClung, who was one of the top mission, missionaries in YWAM there. We, had, we just brought in all kind of people to be nutrients of Father Heart to our family. And so what we did was we got everybody, everybody got up and they had this, I mean, you should watch Inner City Kitty, Kids go to a buffet, a breakfast buffet. You've never seen anything like it, like gorging, stuffing, eating, pockets, stuffing donuts down their pockets. And I'm like, hold on, kids. But that's what you do when you're an orphan. You never know. You never know. And so I'm like, whoa. I mean, boxes of cereal are going down their pants. 
in those little boxes of cereal. I'm like, this is cray cray, but hey, it's okay. Bananas hanging out everywhere, oranges stuffed down. It was hilarious. That's Josh looking all over your house. Yeah, that's you, Josh. I, I see it. <laughs> Josh had to carb up and he had to store up. Carb up and store up. I can see it now, absolutely. Yeah, we set out carbs whenever Josh comes over. We just like trough it out, bro. Trough it out. Plan ahead, yeah. No, no, it's, it's a hilarious story. So first time, I think I've told this story, but again, it works, it's worth merits repeating. This gal named Bertha, she was addicted to crack. She paid for her habit be, being a prostituted woman. She had three kids. So we bring Bertha and her three kids. It's really a tender story, man. You go all the way across 70, across Kansas, that's a challenge. I mean, you got, everybody's got a potty. You know, every 10 minutes, you got potty stops. So you get there, you get there. She steps out of the car. She looks right. It's a 360 view of the mountains. If you've ever been up there at y, the YMCA, she, she's going like this. She's going like this. She looks around, and all of a sudden, she drops in tears. She's sobbing on the parking lot. And I said, what is going on, Bertha? And she goes, I'm thinking, oh, gosh, she's having a mental breakdown or something. She goes, I just heard God tell me he made these mountains for me. And she's sobbing, and I, like, drop down, and I just hold her, and we just rock. We just rock. Just like, oh, my God. And, and uh, Lord, and I just, like, I looked up, and I said, that right there was worth the trip. All the thousands that we spent, it was worth it. Those kids had never had more fun in their life, running into mountain streams, riding horses, throwing horseshoes. It was, the, you know, swimming all the time. I mean, they went nuts. And we had, you know, we had a content time. We had a lot of free time. And then we had campfires and s'mores. And I, I let them in all of my stupid camp songs. And I literally have a lot of stupid camp songs. Wadaliacha being one of them. It's a cr- tradition. I mean, we learned Wadaliacha. We learned these camp songs. We learned all these goofy songs because we're embedded memories of this is what Jesus feels like. Jesus feels like this. So we morphed over, and Laramie gets to host this. This is why the Snowbarger boys come back here all the time and, and keep bugging us. This is their place. This is where they come. So I don't know. It's hard to paint a picture of something this deep every year because it just drifts out of us all the time. It, it's like out of sight, out of mind. It, it just drifts. You just lose. Hey, life is so hard, right? Life is so hard to get to the weekend, to pay the bills, to deal with our own attachment pain, to, to go through the kind of stuff we go through every day in life. It's very, very hard to get the riverbank wider and, and the deeper and to move toward those stages of maturity into parenting and then, oh, ow, 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 a eldering. And it's owie. It's an owie. But I feel like everyone is being invited to eldering status and maturity. You've got to have the fun of hugging a kid. You've got to have that fun. You've got to roll on the ground with kids. You've got to feel what it's like to be paternal and maternal for somebody other than your blood offspring. And honestly, if you're single... You have the best advantage, according to the Apostle Paul. The best. I mean, you're free. You don't have anybody to wake up and answer to. You got all the time in the world to be, woohoo! I get to love the hell out of those people. So don't ever think you're a second class anything, no matter what your status is in marriage or anything else. You got an opportunity to conduct life. Man. So... We're going to get a chance now to practice um, opening our hearts, connecting our hearts. And I don't want to even use the word practice because that sounds like this is not real, and, but that's real. You know, practice is a, it implies this isn't the real game. We're, do, we're, we're warming up for the real game. I don't believe that. I think any time we get together and make eye contact and connect with one another and hear each other's lives and begin to build a bond... 
that go, will go longer than a few minutes, maybe a day, hopefully the rest of our life. I'm in this for the rest of my life. This isn't a gig for me. This isn't a job for me. This is my life. This is what I live for. And I've been on this page since 88. So that's the kind of, you know, how can I say, invitation that the Lord is pulling us into. I get it. We are in a building. We call it the big house. We try not to call it a church building. I get it. I get it. There's a microphone. There's a worship, you know, there's a stage that it could, it could be a little challenging to walk in a building. But I don't see it like that. I see it as a big, I see this is our living room, and that is our family room. We just put in a new family room. You guys got to see it. It's really cool. It's a, it's a, it's a place for m- manual healing, MKFs. It's just a lovey-dovey, comfortable place. You're going to love it. So then I am looking for a kid. When I come in here, I'm looking for a kid. I'm looking for a lease first. She, she was the one I was aiming for at first. I said, I'm going to get my tennis shoes on in case she wants me to chase her. <laughs> That's what I was thinking this morning. I'm going to get my tennis shoes on because I have to chase Elise. Then I've got to throw Annika up, but although, and Adeline, although those two are just, they're, they're dad's muscle build and their mom's muscle build. So it's a little challenging to throw them around now. But honestly, I come here to roll with you and kids and to be just a big, playful kid myself, and then a daddy. That's all I want, is a big, playful, loving, affectionate house, pl- family, that loves people into, their, into healing and maturity. And what's happening here, if you know, now and then people will refer to it as a conference, and I stop it right away. Not, not in a mean way. I just say, hey, oh, whoa, whoa, let me, words are important, words are powerful, This isn't a conference. This isn't a meeting. This is a family reunion. Now, yesterday, I'm on a Zoom call for two hours with Matthew and Alicia Smith. You guys will not believe this couple. We ran into them in Miles City, Montana. They were in our small group. We started asking them questions. We were teaching people how to connect in a small group. By the way, the most terrified people in that whole gathering were the pastors. They were freaked out. They were looking for excuses to walk their dog and not come. I'm not kidding you. Like, I think i got to get my hair done today. And the, the, but the everyday people were longing for a connection. And Matthew and Alicia were those people. Now, they're really beautiful, amazing folk. They live out in the middle of Montana in these mountains. He repairs... um, uh, motorcycles, but not any motorcycle, the antique kind that break down every few miles. <laughs> and and they've, they've, they're, they're empty nesters, they're grandparents, and they said after we were done, I mean, tears and weeping and God showing up in the life, in this life and this life, this life and this life, and it wasn't scripted. We had a few questions, but it was just moved. They were never used to that, and we defined that as church. Two people opening and connecting their hearts and exchanging Jesus. Now we're doing church. Right? Now we're doing church. And two people and then ten people and then a hundred people, whatever it is. All of them are expressions of church. But the basic fundamental is two people with Jesus. And we taught them that. They come away. We have a follow-up debrief at the hotel the day we're leaving town, they're literally electrified. They said, we've prayed for years to find our people, and you're our people. And I'm like, wow. Well, you better not say that until you meet the real people. I mean, the people, the people, people. Say that when you meet them. That's you. That's you. So they're going to roll in here with their little trailer, and I asked them to be the mother and dad hostess, even though this is their first year. They're going to stay out here in the yard And they're going to shower in our showers, and they're going to flush our toilets. Thank you, Bob. Those are Bob's toilets, so I call them all that time. Hey, let's go to Bob's toilet. And what are they going to do? They're going to float around. And you know what the most important thing is? It's the vibe. It's the culture. It's the ecosystem. 
It's the shimmering, plasmic, jelly-like substance of Jesus' affection. Now, we'll have truth. We'll have plenty of truth. We'll have enough truth. I mean, I had one guy say, I want to come to your tribal, but I've heard enough truth about relational skills to last me the next two years. I just need to experience it more. <laughs> but these people are showing up. They, they want more content for sure, but they need experiential learning, and they want to connect and find a people as crazy as they are. And they're willing to leap into a new reality. That's pretty serious stewardship. Do you not understand? And it's very hard for us that live here all the time to understand and grasp the significance of what God's up to in the church. Whatever words you want to use, something big is up. Bible-believing people who love the Holy Spirit the Word of God, the Spirit of God are going to find the family of God. And they're going to learn how to do this even when they're decimated and hurt. And they're going to have to recover. On the way there, there are no perfect leaders. Janet will attest to that. There are no perfect leaders. There are no perfect people. There is no perfect church. It's a big, messy glob of humanity trying to get somewhere. But we're going to get there. We are going to get there. I'm not dying until that happens, and I think it's already happening. I'm not dying until that happens. I refuse to die first until that reality of an actual tribe, translocal, international family of affection, until that happens, I'm not going off the planet. But when it, well, it's happening. So when this, yeah, we might need to have a little heart check after tribal because I believe a breakthrough is happening. Uh, Dolinsky's are coming. John Dolinsky's coming. Josh, thank you. That was Josh's doing. The Dolinsky's are coming from Romania. Just, just, come on. The Blackfords got their world rocked. Here's a, here's a family with five little kids, jump in a car from Houston, drive straight through to here, get out of the car kind of dizzy, hang with you guys, and didn't miss one stinking minute of this whole tribal, absorbed it, and then said, we got to come back and get some more, and lived in our building for three months. Shimmering plasmic, jelly-like ecosystem of heaven. Don't underestimate yourself. That's the point. Don't underestimate yourself. Don't take yourself out of the story. I'm telling you. And hell will try that. We've, had, we've already had people backing out because they got sick and messed up and money issues. I mean, I see it every tribal. People get depressed, freaked out, overwhelmed, hurt. Cir circumstances are tell literally every tribal. I've got people calling me out of desperation. You're going to meet with somebody today that's going through it to kind of stabilize her so she gets here. I'm not literally tribal. There's something about it. There's so much warfare around it, but there's so much beauty around it that it's like, I don't know, birth and a baby. So I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask that the Lord speak to you about yourself and that you basically embrace being a foundational glue person in the long-term forming of a family that ends up changing the way a kid feels about Jesus. That would be an amazing aspiration. So, Father, right now, in Jesus' name, and just take hands with somebody, just if you got, if you're near somebody, just, Jesus, this is supernatural. There's nothing natural about this. Nothing natural about this. I'm asking today that you would expand the riverbanks and the riverbed to enable us to conduct more life from Jesus through our human spirit to the end that ultimately the next generation gets a whole new definition of church. I pray God for all those wounded people that have been destroyed or damaged or wounded with a deep attachment pain in church life. 
Well, that's pretty much everybody. <laughs> I ask God for healing, for a new vision, for a new capacity to heal them up and to in, and pull them into a family story that changes the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, what we're going to do is pass out something, and what, I'd like you to get into twos or threes, gender-specific, and it's going to just take a, a little bit. Thanks, Jeff. You too, Cora. Here. Twos or threes. And this will be our end, so you guys keep watching. I mean, we're going to be off in just a second. I want you to put the armor on. This is a little bit of a runway into loving. You might want to call this a relational rhythm. Everybody's got to eat, they got to fuel their body, they got to rest, and they got to exercise. That's a rhythm of life. A relational rhythm is right down here, nine relational rhythms. I would pick on, um, just go through as many of these as you can, but a main thing I want you to do is ask, how are you feeling right now? Robert needs one back here, the curly-headed redhead. Thank you. How are you feeling and why? Be sure that when you share, you try to keep your sharing into about a minute or two. Don't over-talk. And definitely do not try to fix the person. Do not try to be the Bible answer man. Just listen and have compassionate curiosity and no answers. No preachy sessions, no fixing. Okay? Ready, set, Shandai, go.